Uh, I love that song, Yes I Will, because it, it shows us that we can choose to praise God even in the lowest valleys. So even in the midst of COVID-19 and all this quarantine and things that are going on, the choices we make during this time give evidence to where we're putting our faith and trust and confidence. We trust in the Lord, and when, because we trust in the Lord, we're going to speak a certain way, we're going to act a certain way, we're going to represent Him a certain way. Yes, we're in, a, we're in a valley season right now, but remember that it's in the valley where things grow the most. That's where things grow, in the valleys, in the low places. This is a low time in, in history, but if you choose to see it, this is also one of the greatest times for us as a church, for us as individuals, to see what God is doing in this. This is by no means a surprise to the Lord. He knew about this, and He's made provision for you in the midst of this. But the, that song says, I choose to praise. There's a choice that we have to make. Will we choose to praise Him in the midst of this? What is it that we will glorify? In this time are we going to glorify the the news and the information or the misinformation depending on the source that uh, that we believe during this time is that what we're gonna glorify are we gonna are we gonna glorify the different theories that are out there are we gonna glorify a, polit a political party no as, as believers it is our call to glorify the Lord in all that we do so that means the way that we speak the way that we communicate on, on social media face to face wherever we are we need to make sure that we are communicating the gospel of Jesus Christ in every single way. So choose to praise the Lord throughout this time. Choose to, to continue to glorify Him in everything that you do. Amen? I love that song. Praise the Lord. Yes, I will. Hallelujah. Listen, everyone, uh, before we get into the Word this morning, I have just a few announcements that I want to bring to you. Uh, first and foremost, I want to thank everybody for continuing to give their tithes and their offerings during this time. Remember, our tithes and our offerings is worship to the Lord. That as we give, you know, it, it, is, it is a symbol of us surrendering that part of our life to, to the Lord. And it's not just finances. It's not about money. It's about what that money represents. That represents your time, your talent, your energy that you give so that you can live on this life. And when we submit our, our tithes and our offerings to the Lord, you're saying, Lord, I trust you with my time, my talent, and my treasure. You are God and nothing else. So thank you guys for being so faithful in your tithes and offerings. And uh, for those of you who don't know, there are several ways that you can continue to give during this time. Uh, by mail there on your screen through our PushPay app. You can, uh, you can give that way. Also, you can go online to our website, LegacyFamily.Church, and you can give there too. I also want to encourage everybody, and I've been doing this for a while, but download our Church Center app. If you go on your app store for either Google or Apple, you can download this app, and this is going to be extremely important because we're going to have so much information available to you through this app, from uh, giving your tithes and offerings to our life groups, to different events that are coming up. You can give, uh, uh, I mean, not just give, but you can get all that information on the, the app um, right there. Now, I wanna show you guys something else that's coming up that you'll be able to find on this app, but you can also find it on our, our website. And we are going to be launching our covenant classes online during this time. So you can go onto our website or onto the app there, and you can register for the covenant class what the covenant class is is it is a way for you to connect with the church and it answers uh, all those questions uh, particularly if you're if you're a new believer or new to our church so what is it that we believe what is our vision as a church what are we trying to accomplish with the lord so if you want to be a part of that we'd love to have you it's going to start next week as a matter of fact we're starting this next week so it's may 3rd through the 31st we're skipping mother's day on may 10th we're going to honor the mothers and and give that time but it's four classes. They only take about 45 minutes each. And we're going to answer those, those questions. Who is the, the, the church? Who are we as a church? And how uh, can you get involved and play a part in what God is doing, even in the midst of this time? In addition to that, we're also going to be having our... So we're going to have our Legacy Discipleship Academy. The Legacy Discipleship Academy is that next level of growth for those who, who are walking with the Lord. So this goes beyond just the basics of Christianity, but starts bringing you into the meat of what it is that we believe and then how God wants to use us during this time. 
So there's four tracks in this. There's the foundations, framing, finishing, and fulfilling the purpose of God in your life. So I want to encourage you guys to sign up for these classes. Again, you can go onto our website, LegacyFamily.Church, or you can go onto our um, uh, church app, and you can register right then and there. Lastly, we have our Q&A session at the end of every service. So I want to put this screen uh, number up on the screen for you. Area code 818-835-4030. If you have any questions during the message or um, about the message, anything like that, you can text it in. I'll receive that here, and then we'll be answering those questions at the end of service today. So, awesome. Are you ready for the word? Amen. You got your Bibles. Amen. Well, let's invite the Holy Spirit to be our teacher this morning. Lord God, thank you so much for bringing us together here this morning. Thank you, Lord, for the ability to, to stay connected uh, through technology. We appreciate that, Lord. But above all, Lord, we thank you that you are keeping us connected by the Spirit. So we invite your Holy Spirit right now to be our teacher, to lead us and guide us through your scriptures, so that we can be changed and transformed evermore into the image and likeness of you, Lord Jesus. We thank you that you are bringing us from faith to faith and from glory to glory, and today you have new levels for us to grow to. So open up our hearts and minds, Lord God. Help us to receive and help us to be changed, transformed, uh, and, and encouraged to be more like you. We love you and we give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Got your Bibles with you. All right. Well, listen, I want you to turn to the book of Judges, chapter 6. That's where we're going to hang out today. Judges, chapter 6 this morning. And today I'm going to be talking to you about, as I said earlier, the building up. Last week we talked about the breaking down. And when we think about breaking down, that's not a comfortable thought. And it's not a comfortable stage in the process of being transformed. Um, sorry, it had a little noise in the, in the background. So we are going into this process of transformation right now. I believe that that is why God has us in this time of quarantine. Remember, we talked about last week that part of the process of being transformed, just like a butterfly, is there's that, that call, number one, that we are called to become transformed into the image and likeness of Jesus. We, we also have uh, a time of isolation. We saw that through different uh, uh, people that God placed in the scriptures for us to learn about their lives, from Abraham to Joshua to Jacob, Moses, they all had times of isolation, and we find ourselves in, in isolation right now to a certain extent, where God can really work on us and He can speak to us without the distractions of the world. In, a, in addition, we also have that breaking that has to happen. And uh, when a butterfly you know, gets transformed, remember, they, they go into their isolation, they go into their cocoon, but then it gets broken down literally into a soup. All that they were gets broken down. And then it begins to reform and build. And that's what I want to talk to you about today, is the process by which God builds us back up after breaking us down. And we're going to see this through the life of Gideon and the children of Israel and what they were going through at that particular time. So in Judges chapter 6, we see uh, Gideon, and he is in the, in the threshing, uh, he's threshing wheat in a wine press. But why is he doing that? Let's back up just a little bit. In the time of the judges, this was a, a very confusing time for the children of Israel. What happened was that Joshua, who led them into conquering the land of Canaan, had passed away. And there was no successor, there was no distinct leader that was left behind after him. The people were left to obey the law and the commandments. And God would raise up judges at different times to help guide the people. But they were in this vicious cycle of being blessed by God, and then they would fall into rebellion against God because they got too comfortable. Then God would have to bring an enemy in to humble them and break them down so that then they would be built back up and turn back to the Lord. So we're in the middle of this cycle right now with Gideon. God has sent the Midianites in because, once again, the children of Israel have turned to worship Baal and the other gods of the Canaanites that God specifically told them not to. So they have exalted themselves against God, and there's pride there, and they're, they're going against them. So God sends the Midianites, and the Midianites basically are coming in and taking their food every season. 
Every year at harvest, the Midianites come in and they, they, they storm Israel. They take all their food and Israel is starving to death. So Gideon in chapter 6, we find him hiding from the Midianites. He is in fear of not having his food. So normally they would go to the threshing floors to thresh out the wheat and separate it from the chafe. But he went to the wine press so he could hide from the Midianites who he knew were coming to steal his food. So you find him in a very weakened and vulnerable position. He has truly been broken. He has been broken by the oppression of the Midianites. And now we see that he is in a place where he can receive from God. So let's start at verse 1 and uh, just see what the Lord speaks to Gideon in order to build him up. It says, Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth tree, which was in Oprah, which belonged to Joash, the Abizarite, with his, uh, while his son Gideon threshed wheat in the winepress in order to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. We have Gideon here, and he is in a broken place. And the first thing God does when you are in a broken place, he comes in to confirm your identity. A lot of times we base our identity and our value and who we are on the circumstances and the things that are going on around us. That's not who we are. And maybe what you're going through, but that is not who you are. Gideon is in a very vulnerable, weak position. He's hiding from his enemies and he's just trying to, th to thresh wheat in a wine press so he can eat. He is in survival mode. He is not feeling like he's thriving. He is not feeling very mighty. Yet the Lord comes in and says, you mighty man of valor. Wow. God gave him his identity in that moment. You know, there's a lot of things that, that uh, validate who we are as an individual. One of the things that we get in this country is your driver's license. It's, a, it's an ID. And that, that driver's license is used to validate who you are wherever you go. It has your name, it has your address, it has your eye color, it has your height, it has your weight. Well, maybe your real weight, but it's got all that information on it. And it says that this is who you are. And wherever you go, they ask you, can I see your ID? Can I see your ID? I need to validate who you are. And the reason that it's so important to these people is because they only trust that ID because it was issued by an authority that they respect. So you have been issued an ID by the Heavenly Father who created you. And that is what validates who you are. It is not your accomplishments. It is nothing else. When, they, when you go to the grocery store and you use your credit card and they want to validate your ID to make sure that it matches, they don't ask for your high school diploma. They don't ask you what your GPA was. They don't ask you know, what sports you played. They don't ask how much money you make. They don't ask any of those things because you're... Your ID isn't, your identity isn't based on what you've done or what you've accomplished or what you haven't accomplished. It's based on the fact that there is an authority that says this is who you are. And you need to know that God calls you his own. He says, you are my son, you are my daughter, and I've given you all the heavenly attributes that you need in order to accomplish the work. It doesn't matter your circumstances. I have validated you. I have called you by name. I have saw fit that you be born into this earth for such a time as this, and I have given you gifts and talents and abilities. It doesn't matter where you're at right now. I know who you are, and I know what you can do. And you need to take that as more valuable and more important and more sustaining than anything that circumstances are doing right now. Because circumstances were not looking good for Gideon. They just weren't. But God, when he goes to build you up, he reminds you who you are. You need to have something in your home that, that tells you who you are before the Lord. You need to write down what He says about you. There's a list of 101 things that God says about you. I'll, I'll find a way to, to make it available to the church. But it's so important to see yourself the way God sees you. He is the authority that issues your identification. And it doesn't matter what anybody else says or thinks. That is who you are. And what a beautiful example of that here with Gideon. So in that process of building up, number one, validation of your identity. Remember who God says you are. Now listen to Gideon's response. It's so common the way we, we think so many times. Gideon said to him, O oh my Lord, 
If the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his miracles, which our fathers told us about, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. Gideon comes back with questions based on his circumstances. You say this about me, but look at our circumstances. Where's all the, the blessings that we saw in the past? Where's the, the, the power of God that our forefathers talked about? He's, he's not paying attention to the fact that they were in complete rebellion against God. He's not aware of that. All he knows is circumstances. I don't see the blessings of God. But look how God responds in verse 14. Then the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours, and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? Wow. The second thing God does, and first of all, I want to point this out. God doesn't even acknowledge the excuses of, of Gideon. He doesn't even answer those questions. He just says, yeah, that's good. Go in this might of yours, reminds him again of his position and his identity, and gives him a task. This is the second thing the Lord God does to build us up. He gives us little things to do. He gives us a vision of what we're going to do, but then he begins to give us little things to accomplish along the way. Anytime you're, you're being built up, think of it like, like working out. In order for you to, to get stronger and to be built up when you're working out, you, you set a goal. He, he says to Gideon right here, look, go in this might of yours and you're going to deliver Israel from the Midianites. He, he sets this goal for him. And, and tells him where he's going to, to be, regardless of the excuses. Well, I don't have the, the right genetics. I don't have the right makeup. I don't have all this stuff. He says, here's the vision. This is what you're going to do, and gives him a challenge. So he gives him his identity, and then gives him a challenge to meet that identity. His identity was a mighty man of valor. The challenge now is to go in this might of yours and deliver Israel. Once again, we hear Gideon's response. So he said to him, O oh my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I'm the least in my father's house. So he's saying, look, don't you know where I come from? Don't you know the, the weakness of my clan? He said, I'm the weakest of the clan, and I'm the weakest of the household. And by the way, Manasseh was a half-tribe of Israel. They weren't even a full tribe. They came from, from Joseph, and Joseph had two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. And they were called the half-tribe. So you've got a half-tribe with this guy in the least of that clan, and he is the least in his father's house, hiding right now in a wine press, and God is calling him a mighty man of valor. Gideon's having a hard time getting over his circumstances and how he sees himself. Verse 16 says, And the Lord said to him, Surely I will be with you, and you shall defeat the Midianites as one man. Then he said to him, If I have now found favor in your sight, then show me a sign that it is you who talk with me. Do not depart from me here, I pray, until I come to you and bring out my offering and set it before you. And he said, I will wait until you come back. So Gideon is hearing the voice of the Lord. But now he says, look, I just want to make sure that it's you. This is an important step that we see in, in, in Gideon's process in getting to know the Lord. He, he recognizes that this is, this is God, but he wants that, that confirmation that is of the Lord. This is an important part of our process in growth and building up. We are getting to know the Lord better. So we have to look for those confirming things. And we have to understand that God will give you confirmation. He gives you your identity. He gives you a charge. And then he gives you confirmation. If you skip forward a little bit, you see that Gideon goes and prepares a meal for him. And he places it on the rock. And at verse 21, it says, Then the angel of the Lord put out the end of the staff that was in his hand and touched the meat and the unleavened bread. And the fire rose out of the rock and consumed the meat and the unleavened bread. And the angel of the Lord departed out of his sight. Now Gideon perceived that he was the angel of the Lord. So Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. Then the Lord said to him, Peace with you. Do not fear. You shall not die. So Gideon built an altar there to the Lord and called it, The Lord is Peace. To this day, it is still there. So God gave him his identity, gave him his call, 
and then gave him confirmation, yes, I have spoken to you. God wants to confirm the work that he's doing in your life. And you might think, well, I, I don't see any fire coming out of rocks or anything like that. That's how the Lord chose to confirm himself to Gideon. But God is going to confirm himself to you as well. Think about all those times where you weren't exactly sure if this is what God wanted you to do. And you just started moving in a direction. And all of a sudden, things just started happening. People started saying things. Circumstances just started lining up. You get a phone call from a person and who confirms what you were thinking that very day. God knows how to confirm the word that he has given you. And you need to be looking for that confirmation. Here's, here's three ways that you can get confirmation about what God has called you to do. Number one, the word of God, your Bible. Anything that God calls you to do will be confirmed in his scriptures. He's not going to call you to do something that is outside of his character. It will always be in alignment with his character, with his scriptures, and with his ultimate mission, and that is to see people come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. So it will always line up with that. So that's number one, the confirmation in the scriptures. Number two, he will give you a confirmation in your heart. The Holy Spirit will speak to you in your heart and in your conscience, and you will have a compelling drive to move forward with what God has called you to do. Even though there may be some hesitation like we see with Gideon, even though there may be some doubts and some fears, it's okay. God will put a compelling uh, drive in your heart to do those things and speak to you in that way. So what are you compelled to do? What are those things that if you don't accomplish it, you'll feel like you've missed out on something? And then number three, he will send people to confirm what he's spoken to you. Most often, God is going to confirm with people. He's not going to command with people. God wants a personal relationship with you. So he is going to speak to you individually about the things that he has for you. And then he will send individuals to confirm that which he's already spoken to you. Most of the time, God's not going to give you a command through someone else. It's a confirmation. So be, be careful of that because there are a lot of people who want to say, Thus saith the Lord, God told me this, God spoke this to me, God put this on my heart for you, all these different things. Make sure that you, you, you test every spirit. And make sure that it lines up with those first two items that I gave you to confirm with. One, the Word of God. Does it line up with the Word of God? And then number two, does it line up with what God has placed in your heart already to accomplish? So those are three ways that you can get confirmation from the Lord. So let's move on. God is building Gideon up here. Gives him his identity. Gives him a charge. Gives him confirmation. He's just building his faith little by little. Now, what God does is he'll often give us a task that is in alignment with what he's called us to do, but it's not the ultimate goal. See, he wants to give us little things. It's kind of like when you're, again, I, I like relating it to working out because building, the process of building up our bodies is very similar to the way that we build up our spirit. I think it's exactly the same thing, as a matter of fact, and God did that on purpose so that we have a tangible physical example of how we can build up the intangible spirit within us. When we want to get stronger as, as a human being in our physical body, we, we work out, we exercise. Well, well what is that, that exercise doing? You're putting strenuous uh, pressure on your muscles that causes them to break down, and then you are the healing process builds you back up so you come back stronger than what you were before so part of that taking on resistance process is that you take on a little bit of resistance at first and then increase as you go until you get to your to your maximum goal so if you want to bench 300 pounds you don't start by throwing 300 pounds on and seeing how well you can do with it no go ahead and start at 100 pounds and just get real comfortable with that. Your body will be broken down, tear down, and then heal, and then come back. So we're about to see like a, a starting set weight that God puts on for Gideon here. And he asks him to do something very specific, and it's so symbolic and significant. In verse 25, it says, Now it came to pass the same night that the Lord said to him, Take your father's young bull, the second bull of seven years old, and tear down the altar of Baal that your father has, and cut down the wooden image that is beside it. And build an altar to the Lord your God on top of this rock, in the proper arrangement. 
and take the second bowl and offer a burnt sacrifice with the wood of the image you shall cut down. The first task that God gave Gideon to do was not to go out and conquer the external. He told him to conquer the internal. There was an internal conflict in his household. He needed to get rid of the idolatry in his own home. He said, go to your father's house and break down the idols. Construct an, op- uh, an altar in the proper way. And then make the sacrifice using the idol as uh, wood for the fire and burn it. Wow. God wants us to deal with the internal before we ever take on the external. There are idols and things in our life that need to be dealt with before we can go out and accomplish the things that he's called us to do. And we need to have the courage to break down those idols in our life. It it may be an idol of, of pride that we think our way is always the better way. It might be uh, an idol of anxiety and fear where we are so hesitant to do those things because we're always thinking about what is the worst possible thing that could happen and we let our imagination take us into that place. It could be uh, any number of habits and hangups that we have, addictions that we fall into. Whatever those things are, those are going to be the first things that God calls us to conquer and cut down in our life. So he's going he's gonna to bring confirmation to you, but he's going to bring these little things that we need to conquer. And it's usually conquering that part of us, those idols that we have in our own life that is going to be most important. So Gideon get, is given this challenge. And by the way, some of these idols, this wasn't his idol. It was his father's idol. You know, I had this conversation with my children just this week. I said, you know, the things that I'm asking you to do are so that you can cut down the things that maybe your mother and I have passed on to you and you guys can be better. There might be uh, limitations and weaknesses that we have that you guys have to be able to see and then cut those things down so you can grow and go far beyond what your mother and I have done for the Lord. And that's just part of that process. So sometimes it's not your things necessarily, but they become a part of you because of the culture that you're in, maybe uh, family, uh, genetics, whatever it is, mindsets, whatever those things are. It's not always necessarily your fault that they are there, but it is our responsibility to handle them when God has called you on to a greater place and he's trying to build you up. Remember, this is, the, this is the first stage. This is not the ultimate battle that we're talking about here. This is the first battle, is, is us, in dealing with our own hearts and the things that have impacted that. So he, t- he gives them this command, and in verse 27 it says, So Gideon took ten men from among his servants and did as the Lord said to him. But because he feared his father's household and the men of the city too much to do it by day, he did it by night. Gideon's still dealing with a little bit of fear. But what I love is, God didn't rebuke him for being afraid and doing it at night. This is, this is the next thing that God does. is He has patience with you through your process. So he brings confirmation. He gives you a little task to do. And then he's patient with you as you work that out in whatever strength you have now. God is not expecting you to be perfect. He's not expecting you to have it all together. He's just saying, take on this little thing that I'm asking you to do. And with whatever strength you got, with whatever ability you have right now, wherever your faith is right now, I'm good with that. Just go for it. So Gideon, he didn't have any specific instructions. He took 10 of his father's servants to help him. That's a good thing. You build a team. He went out by night when he was most comfortable, and then he got it done. And God said, you know what, Gideon? That's a good job. That's a good job. You did what I told you to do. Yes, you went at night. Yes, you were afraid to do it. But it's not you being afraid that God is concerned about. We, should have, we, we, we often have a little bit of fear, but it's our ability to operate and go move past the fear that, that is a blessing to the Lord and validates your growing in your process. So he gets it done. And then uh, I'm going to paraphrase this next section. They come out, the men come out in the city and they're like, who did this? Who cut down this, this altar of Baal? Who is now sacrificing to the one true God? What's going on? We're going to kill him. And then they say, it was Gideon. Gideon did it. So somebody ratted him out. But his father steps to his defense. Now remember, this is, this is Gideon's father's idol that he cut down. But his father, Joash, steps out when they want to kill Gideon. 
And he says, why are you defending Baal? If Baal's God, let him defend himself. And if anybody touches my son, I'll kill you. So the one who should probably be the most angry, his father, is the one that defends him. When you step out and do what God has called you to do, I'll tell you right now, you are going to catch some heat. But God always raises up protection for you, sometimes from the most unlikely places. And again, that's just further confirmation that God is with you. It's a scary thing to do some of the things that God has asked us to do. But he is always going to bring confirmation. He'll always bring people to support and undergird you. Always. So be looking for that in this, in this process. So now, God brings him to the next level of growth. And remember, Gideon still isn't at that place of being fully transformed yet. God is still just building him up. He's giving him confirmations. He's giving him small challenges and tasks to do, and he's doing them. And he's bringing more confirmation afterwards. So now he's called him to the next level. And he says, he says look, I want you to go out and I want you to... Uh, uh, attack the the Midianites. Let's look at verse 33. It says, Then all the Midianites and the Amalekites, the people of the east, gathered together, and they crossed over and encamped in the valley of Jezreel. So they're, they're coming for Israel. Listen to verse 34. But the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon, and he blew the trumpet, and the Abyssalites gathered behind him. Keep in mind, these are the, the Abyssalites, these are the ones who just wanted to kill him. The ones who just wanted to kill him have now rallied behind him. And he sent messengers throughout all Manasseh who also gathered behind him. He also sent messengers to Asher, Zebulun, and Naphtali, and they came up to meet them. So all of a sudden, Gideon gets bold. Why? Because when you pass those little tasks and God sees that he can trust you with the little things, even though you're afraid, now he empowers you. God will empower you. It says the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon, and he blew the trumpet. Man, when the Spirit of the Lord comes upon you, you change. You transform. And that's that next part of that building process, that final thing. The Spirit of the Lord comes upon you. And he blew that trumpet. And now the people who wanted to kill him, Manasseh, Naphtali, Zebulun, they all gathered behind this guy who was just hiding in the wine press afraid but God built him up and showed him how he could be and transformed his heart and then boom empowers him to go out and do what is right but he's still he's still not done with the full transformation process this moment was a gift of the spirit for him to to rally everyone around him so Gideon is going to go out it says God if you will save Israel you know, I, I'm going to fleece you. You guys have heard that term in the church probably, fleecing. Well, it comes from this story in Gideon when he says, Look, God, if you want me to go out and save Israel, I know you said it, but I'm still in that place where I need more confirmation. Listen, a lot of times people have taught that you don't fleece God because that's a lack of faith. It is not a lack of faith to ask God to confirm what he's called you to do, even though he's already confirmed you before. It is, it is a place of growth. So don't let anyone make you feel like you don't have faith because you keep asking God the same thing. He wants you to. He's, he's growing you. You should absolutely ask for confirmation. And we see that in this process of Gideon here. He says, Lord, if you want me to go, then I, I'm going to put out a fleece. And I want there to be dew on the, on the fleece in the morning, but not on the ground. And then I'll know. So he puts out the fleece and God does it. He, he, he puts out dew on the fleece and there's no dew on the ground. He wrings it out. And then Gideon comes back and says, can I ask you one more time? Please don't be mad at me. I just want to make absolutely sure that you're calling me to do what you've called me to do. And he says, I'm going to put the fleece out again. And now I want there to be dew on the ground, but no, no dew on the fleece. And God does it for him. It is okay to ask God for confirmation after confirmation after confirmation, especially when it is a big decision. Gideon is getting ready to lead an army against overwhelming odds so it is right to get extra confirmation and make sure that you are doing the right thing before god what are some big decisions that you may need uh this level of confirmation on in in in, in this type of process if you're getting married you don't just want to rush in and say hey this is a this sounds like a good idea i've got feelings for you you got feelings for me no allow there to be 
ample confirmation that this is the person, this is the time for you to be married. That is a big decision that's going to impact the rest of your life. Maybe whether you start that business or not. That's a big decision. You're going to be pouring time and talent and energy. It's going to impact you and your family. Make sure you get ample confirmation. Don't be tricked into thinking that you're just full of faith and you just charge out there like a cavalier and, and just get it done. No. One of the reasons that God chose Gideon and many of the other people in the Bible is because they were meek and humble and they would question themselves and turn to God. You see that with Moses. Moses said, who am I? You see that with David. David was like, who am I to be the, the son-in-law to the king? Why is it that you've chosen me, Lord? You see that with, with the prophet Isaiah. You see it with, with Jeremiah. Most of the people that God came to and chose to do great things were people of a very meek and humble countenance because they would take it seriously and they would not trust themselves but then trust the Lord. So that is actually a sign of greater faith. That is a greater faith to ask God for continuing confirmation than it is just to charge out there. Because when you ask for confirmation, you're putting your faith in God. When you just charge out there and do it yourself, you're putting your faith in yourself. And that's when we get into trouble. That's when things fall apart. So you see that in this process of building Gideon up, you see that he is building his confidence, but he's not building his self-confidence. He's building his Christ confidence. That is the confidence that we must have. Our confidence in Christ. Everything nowadays is about self. God is not about self. God is about self-denial and then turning our self over to Him. That's what He's growing in us. He's not growing self-confidence. He's growing Christ's confidence. And we see that demonstrated here. He's turning to the Lord to confirm what it is that He's called Him to do. Amen. I'm excited about that. So now, he, he continues in this process of growth. So he says, yes, I'm going to do it. And then he gathers all the army. And he says, Gideon, these are too many people to go and fight with. I don't want Israel to think that they delivered themselves. They must be humbled and realize that it was me who delivered. So he brings them down to the, to the brook. And he says, the soldiers that I want you to use are going to drink and lap like a dog. The other ones are going to get on their knees and drink. All the ones that get on their knees and drink, send them away. The ones that lap water like a dog and bring it to their face, they're the ones that I, keep, uh, I want you to keep. And there were 300 of the thousands, and he sent all the other ones away. So now he has 300 against tens of thousands in the valley. But Gideon trusted the Lord. Why? Because God had built him up. He built him to that place of faith and trusting him. But Gideon still wasn't at that place yet. So look what happens and go to verse 9. So this happens right after he selected his 300. Verse 9 in chapter 7, I'm sorry, we just skipped over to chapter 7. Judges chapter 7, verse 9. It said, happened on the same night that the Lord said to him, Arise, go down against the camp, for I have delivered them into your hand. But, listen to the Lord's but, but if you are afraid, go down. Go down to the camp with Purah, your servant, and you shall hear what they say. And after you, afterwards, your hands will be strengthened to do, go down against the camp. God says, look, this is what I'm telling you to do. But if you're afraid, go down and listen in the camp. You'll be encouraged. God did not condemn him for being afraid. He, in, in fact, God was so loving and he was so good in this process that he said, look, if you're afraid, I've made provision to encourage you. That's, in something, to important, that's something important for us to remember as parents. When we, want our, when we are encouraging our children to do something, you know, it's okay for them to be afraid. You, ultimately, you don't want them to operate in fear. But when they're in that process of growth, it's okay for them to be afraid. And then you just make provision for them to be encouraged. And look at Gideon. He took him up on it. And he wasn't ashamed to say, you know what, I'm a little scared of this. So he goes down to the camp. It says, then he went down with Purah, his servant, to the outpost of the armed men uh, who were in the camp. Now the Midianites and Amalekites, all the people of the east, were lying in the valley as numerous as locusts. And their cam camels were without number, as a sand by the seashore in multitude. How, that's not encouraging so far. So he's seen this incredibly huge army, and he has to go down and be encouraged. But it says, And when Gideon had come there, 
There was a man telling a dream to his companion. He said, I have had a dream. To my surprise, a loaf of barley bread tumbled into the camp of Midian. It came to a tent and struck it so that it fell and overturned, and the tent collapsed. This his companion answered and said, uh, Then his companion answered and said, This is nothing else. Wait, where? I lost my place. Hold on. This is the good part. This is nothing else but the sword of Gideon and the son, the son of Joash, a man of Israel. Into his hand, God has delivered Midian and the whole camp. What? Gideon goes down and this guy is telling one of his friends a dream that he had about barley coming into the camp and knocking over the tent. And his friend gets a revelation from God and says, this is nothing but the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, coming in and destroying. God's given him this place. He told the enemy, you're about to get wrecked. And that encouraged Gideon. So he goes back in this encouragement that God prepared for him because he was afraid. And he carries out God's instructions. And they deliver a mighty blow to the people of uh, the Amalekites, the Midianites, all of them. They were destroyed. And they, they turned on each other. God fought for them. What an amazing encouragement. So you see this entire process from validating his identity and reminding him who he really is to, to, to now giving him a challenge and a vision of the call that he had. Then he confirmed that it was him. And then he gave him those little challenges, first dealing with the, the internal uh, struggles of his household and taking down the idols then calls him out after empowering him by the Holy Spirit to go against these people, shrinks down his army to, to make sure that it's just him, encourages him again because he knows he's afraid, and then delivers a, a, a tremendous blow to the enemy. And what's interesting is after that, after that, that next victory that he had, Gideon didn't fleece anything else. God had built him up to the place where he was now Christ confident. So now when God told him to do something, he just went out and did it. And all of a sudden you see this boldness inside of Gideon to where now he is even challenging enemies. Go ahead and finish the story of Gideon. It's, it's, it's amazing. But he turns into this fierce warrior, truly a mighty man of valor. God told him what he was going to be and then built him up. And he was so mighty in, in valor that the people, all the people gathered to him and said, Be our king. We want you to rule over us. But in that moment, it proved why God chose Gideon. Because when everyone wanted to exalt him as king, when everybody wanted to put him in position to rule over them, he said, no, the Lord will rule over you. See, that's the difference between somebody who has self-confidence, who has yet to be broken by God, and someone who has been broken by God and built up into Christ's confidence. You are able to say, this is not me, this is the Lord. And that's what God wants to develop inside of you. Uh, a condition that recognizes what you can do through him. That is a humble servant. That is what God is trying to transform us into during this time. He wants to build you up from faith to faith and glory to glory. But it is a process. It is absolutely a process. It is a process to be broken down. And then it is a process to be built back up. And I want to encourage you, if you didn't listen to last week's message, I want to encourage you to do that. Because before God can build you up, you must be broken. You must be broken down. God can't build a new structure until you break down the old one. I, I, I can remember seeing so many uh, videos of, of buildings, old buildings that needed to be uh, broken down. And there's just this crumbling that happens. But that must happen. They must bring down the building. They must clean up everything. And then they can build a new and better structure. That's what God is doing. So remember the, the blessing of brokenness ushers in the beauty of building up god wants to build you up and this is how he's going to do it so family let's engage in this process and let's be patient in this process too don't try and rush god's development of you 
See, when you when you're in the building process, just like I said, when you're working out, there's pain. You ever worked out and you're sore? There's a pain that comes from the building up of the Lord. But it's a good pain because you know that you're growing and you're being strengthened. But if you try and rush the process and you use bad form, you can injure yourself. And that is a different kind of pain. When you try and rush the process, when you won't let God do the work that he needs to do in your life, you can try and get ahead of him. And because you don't have proper form, you end up injuring yourself. And that is not a good type of pain. That is the pain of delay. That delays your development because you weren't patient in letting God work things out in his own time. So engage in the process, but engage with humility. Engage with patience. And these are the fruit of having been broken. This is the, the, the fruit of having realized that God is God and this isn't about you. It is about him living through you, which is better for you anyway. So the only real way to love self is to deny self and offer yourself to God. And if you're listening right now and you've never done that, I want to give you an opportunity to do that right now. God loves you and he calls you. He is calling you to be his son and his daughter. And he has a plan and a purpose for your life. And he wants to build you up into that. But it begins with being broken, saying, Lord, I need you. I am a sinner who has made mistakes. I have done wrong and I know it. And I know that I need your forgiveness. Let me tell you, Jesus Christ is God. He came to this earth over 2,000 years ago to die for those very sins that you know you've committed. Those sins that we've committed, they don't just pass away. No, they need to be forgiven. They need to be paid for. And Jesus took our punishment on himself and died on the cross. That was his process. That was God's process of humbling himself to die on the cross for things that he never did so that you could live. But see, on the third day, he was raised from the dead to prove that he had dominion over death. And that way he could offer eternal life to those who believe. And he offers not only purpose in this life, but eternal life with him forever. All we have to do is put our confidence in him. And just as we saw Gideon submit to the Lord, submit to him and let him guide you through this process. If you want to do that right now, I want to encourage you to say a simple prayer with me. It's a prayer of repentance. The Bible says that we need to repent. That's a word that means that we change the direction of our life. We change our mind and go in a different way. If you're listening to this, let's be honest. If you don't know Jesus, you've tried everything. You've tried relationships, you've tried money, you've tried going after careers, you've tried, uh, you know, entertainment, all these things, but you know nothing satisfies. You are not living a fulfilled life if you don't know Jesus and have not allowed him to come into your life because you are designed to need him. So I want you to do this with me. Say this prayer. Repent. Say, I'm going to go in a different direction. I was going over here and it's not working out. I know that. But I'm going to go this way. I'm going to go towards Christ. Just say this with me. Say, Heavenly Father, thank you for dying for my sins. I need your forgiveness because I've done wrong. Please forgive me of my sins. I accept you, Jesus, as my Lord and my Savior. I believe that you died for my sins and that on the third day you were raised from the dead and that through you I can have eternal life. I give you my life and I surrender. And I ask that you would now teach me and show me how to live for you. I am breaking before you so that you can build me up into who it is you've called me to be. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, let me tell you, God heard you. And it's okay if you don't understand everything. It's okay if you're a little bit afraid. It's okay if you have a little bit of doubt. You are in process right now. But we want to help you through that process. And the way that we can help you now, given our circumstances with the quarantine, is if you go onto our website, it's legacyfamily.church, and click on the connect button. And just give us your name and whatever contact information you're most comfortable with. And one of my team members is going to get in contact with you and just kind of help you through those next steps of like, now what do I do? Because there is that question. It's like, what step is next for me in the process? Well, we want to make sure that we, we get an agreement with God and we, we help you understand who you are. You get, give you that identity, you know, give you that confirmation that the decision that you made here today was correct and allow God to confirm that in you. We want to challenge you and give you those little challenges of, of growing in the Lord and, and, and understanding who he is and furthering your, your, your development. And we, we would be blessed if you would give us the opportunity to do that today. 
So if you would go onto our website again, legacyfamily.church, uh, we would love to just celebrate you, love on you, and get in agreement and welcome you into the family of God together. So with that family, uh, praise the Lord for anyone who prayed that prayer. Uh, praise the Lord for anyone who is recommitting themselves to the Lord Jesus too. You can recommit yourself to the Lord as well. Praise the Lord for anyone who's decided to engage in this process of development. And more than anything, praise the Lord for those who were convicted by the Holy Spirit to break before God and to relinquish self so that you can gain Christ. That is the most important decision that you can ever make. And sometimes, even though we've accepted Jesus as our Savior, we must accept Him as Lord. That means that we surrender to everything that uh, He's He's wants to do in our life. So I encourage you guys, let's stay after it. Let's look at those process, that process of building up in engage in that with the Lord. He's doing it in you right now. He's doing it in your life right now. So be in the word, be in prayer, be in as much fellowship as you can with the brethren and allow God to challenge you. And whatever he's calling you to do, do it with all your heart and with all your strength as unto the Lord. Amen. Well, right now I'm going to I'm going to take a few few questions. So remember, if you have any questions, you can you can text those questions in to 818-835-4030. Zero, and I'll be answering those so any questions at all you can text them in right there looks like we got a few coming in let's see um, what if you pray for something for a long time but the Lord doesn't answer does that mean it's not his will even though it lines up in his word that's an excellent excellent question and one that a lot of people have it's like, I've been praying and asking God, but, but there doesn't seem to be an answer. What's, what's going on? Well, here's the interesting thing. God always answers prayer. Always. He never does not answer prayer. It's just that sometimes the answer is no. <laughs> because he knows our end from the beginning, and he knows what's good for us. So even if something lines up with the word, it may not be exactly what he wants for you in this particular season of your development. It, it's kind of a hard thing to answer because every prayer is, is precious and specific to the Lord and His desire for you. But just generally speaking, sometimes it's yes, sometimes it's no, and sometimes it's not right now. So we don't always know exactly what it is moving forward. But when we look back, we always see the hand of God. There have been so many times where I've prayed and asked God earnestly for something, and it was for good reason, but then I look back and I see exactly why he said no, or exactly why he said wait. I pray for him for something, and then 10 years later, it happens. I was just not in the process. I had been built up yet to the place where I was able to handle that responsibility, or uh, I finally built up to the place where I realized that that's not for me. So God, God always answers prayer. It's just that sometimes it's, it, it's no, and sometimes it's not right now. Um, what happens to the Muslim farmer who grew up Muslim and has done no wrong? Uh, does he go to hell because he didn't believe in Jesus Christ? Uh, this is a this is a question that that comes up very often and it doesn't need to just be a Muslim it could be a Buddhist it could be an atheist but you have somebody who does good works but they come to the end of their life and they have not accepted Jesus Christ even though they've done good things uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna answer this on uh, on a few uh, different levels here um, first let me answer it uh, with with uh, with this in mind God is a just God so if he is just, whatever his judgment is, is the right judgment. And we just have to, to trust that. So that's kind of a, 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 an umbrella statement right there. The, the next level I want to bring it to is the, the, the level of revelation. God will give everyone a level of revelation of who he is. So that means that he is going to speak to people and let them know that he is. The Bible says that creation is te itself testifies that there is a God. And so th there's no excuse for not knowing God specifically and the morality that he expects us to, to embrace and live by, the good that he's called us to do. It's in, our, it's, in our, uh, it's in our conscience. So he can judge us based just on that. Now bringing it down to a theological 
level, and that is the understanding of who Jesus is and accepting him as Lord and Savior. And if you've had the opportunity to know Jesus, in this particular case, the, the question asked for a Muslim. Well, a Muslim, if they uh, are, are devout in their, in their faith, the, the faith of, of Islam, then they acknowledge Jesus. They read the Bible almost as much as they read the Quran. As a matter of fact, many of the, the Muslims that I've met know the Bible better than a lot of Christians. So they know who Jesus is. They, in fact, they believe that Jesus is the one who's going to come back and execute judgment. They just believe that he's going to execute judgment on Christians and Jews and not Muslims. So they know who Jesus is. They just don't accept who he is as Messiah. They believe that he was a good prophet, but they don't believe that he was the Lord. So in that, there is a denial of Christ. They're actually denying Jesus as Christ because they know very well who he is. So in that sense, they are without excuse. But in the broader sense, what about those who don't know God? They know God to whatever extent he's, a, he's revealed himself, and on that they will be judged. But our job is this. We preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to every creature and invite them to know Jesus so that there is no question in their heart or in their mind. Everything else, that falls on the Lord, and he is just. Um, great, great question. Um, says, it has been suggested that Gideon's fleece was not really an acceptable request, yet the Lord graciously accommodated him. Gideon's request required a particular miracle. We shouldn't really be asking for extraordinary miracles, should we? Jesus' ministry showed that even a sign rarely changes one's mind. Could you please elaborate on the concept of fleecing the Lord and its misuse? Is it appropriate to ask exceptional miracles or simply guidance, um, etc.? Well, one of the things I want to point out is, uh, I believe it was, first of all, with Gideon, it was absolutely acceptable. If it wasn't acceptable, then God wouldn't have asked, uh, I answered him. But one of the things that we see in this scenario is that God had empowered him by the Spirit. Remember, it says the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and then he blew the trumpet and the people gathered to him. So there are requests that are led by the Spirit. I've made many a, re a re fleecing. Fleecing, I have made it a part of my life. But I'm not asking for God to, like, all right, make the sun stand still or anything. Because the Spirit of God in me is going to lead me what to ask. So if you're making ridiculous requests of God, you know, many people who, who aren't believers will say, well, if Jesus walks through the wall right now, then I'll believe. Well, no, that's not how it works. Y you don't command him. He commands you. Gideon's request was out of confirmation, not proving God. So I think there's a distinction that has to be made, that has to be made there. But if you, are, if you have accepted Christ as Gideon had accepted the call of God, if you have been filled with the Spirit as Gideon was filled with the Spirit, then your heart is going to be in alignment with God, and God is going to move your heart to request the things that He wants for you anyway. It's an interesting dynamic. So um, I don't believe for one second that it was an unacceptable request. I think that's bad theology. Um, it, it, people, people want to teach that because they want to make sure that people aren't asking for ridiculous things. Like people will literally throw a fleece out right now and, and do that. If the Spirit of the Lord is behind it, then he'll do it. Uh, you know. So I think we just have to trust the Lord. And if, if God gives us an example in the Word, then I think it's safe to, to trust that. Um, let's see. Let's see, why, why would a loving God, loving and forgiving God, ask his people to perform black magic rituals of blood sacrifice during the Levitical law of offerings and sacrifice? Hmm. That's an interesting way that the, the question is phrased. It says, why would a loving and forgiving God ask his people to perform black magic rituals of blood sacrifice during the Levitical law of offerings and sacrifice okay so two separate questions there I want to frame it a little bit differently first of all it's not black magic if it's black magic then it's black magic but if God tells you to do it it's right because God is sovereign and he is God whatever he does is right and it's holy and if he asks us to do it it's right and it's holy what that's basing it on is our uh, uh, our discomfort it's an uncomfortable thing to slaughter an animal and watch them suffer and die 
And that was actually the point of animal sacrifice. Here, animals, and one of the reasons that we are appalled that anyone would hurt an animal, I mean, it's almost, people are almost more appalled when you hurt an animal than they do if you hurt a human being. It's kind of crazy. That's just kind of the culture that we're in right now. But the reason we feel that way in our hearts is because we look at animals as innocent. They didn't do anything wrong to deserve this, and they're being treated poorly. And that is horrendous, and God doesn't want that. God, God loves all the animals that he created. He didn't want that. But the reason he commanded people to do animal sacrifice was not because he needed the blood of bulls. As a matter of fact, he says in Psalms that those do, it does nothing for him. The blood of bulls wasn't for him. It was for us so that we could see with our own eyes what sin does. Sin causes death. Sin causes innocence to be hurt. Sin causes destruction. God wanted a physical, tangible sign of sin. When, when they would sacrifice the lamb before God, it had to be perfect and without spot or blemish. So these families would take these perfect lambs and they would keep them in their homes and they would cherish them like a pet because they couldn't have any spot or blemish. They couldn't get injured. So they had to love and care and pet and feed them and take good care of them. But the problem was is that now you have to take this innocent lamb and slaughter it. Why? Because you sinned. So the slaughter of animals was to, to, for the revelation of how bad our sin is. And that's part of the, one of the um, difficult things that we have in, in this time. It's not that people sin. It's that people don't think sin's that bad. That is a horrible place to be in. You don't think that lying is that bad. You don't think that adultery is that bad. You don't think that lust is that bad. But if you had to kill an animal every time you did it, you would understand just how bad it was because you would see the pain it caused an innocent life. So that was the point of the animal sacrifice. It wasn't to fully appease. And it was also a demonstration of what Christ would do, the lamb that was slain, that he was without spot or blemish, yet he willingly sacrificed his life and went to the slaughter for us to pay for our sins for all eternity. So that's the message of it. So it's not, it's not black magic. Um, there was a question about discipleship classes. Uh, discipleship classes are uh, eight classes and all of the materials will be provided. You'll be able to download those online if you go onto the website or our, our app there. Um, next question says, what if I'm trusting God and ready to do what the Lord wants me to do, but I don't think I can because of this quarantine? How can I know when the time is right? Interesting. God will let you know. There's always this, uh, this strange balance and, and juxtaposition between obeying authorities and then when do those authorities cross the line. I think that God will confirm it to you just like, excuse me, just like he confirmed it to Gideon. Remember, it's confirmed in the word of God, it's confirmed in your heart, but then it's confirmed with the people around you. So I would always seek wise counsel, people who love the Lord, love you, and will tell you the truth no matter how it impacts you. So we got to surround ourselves with people that love us enough to tell us the truth. If you surround yourself with a bunch of yes people, you're always going to think it's God. It always feels like God in your heart, but you have to be around people that will say, nope, I don't believe that's God, or I don't believe that's the right timing. So God will always have people and authority in our lives that can speak into our lives and help give us guidance and understanding on, on the what and the when of what God is calling us to do. Great question. All right. Can you, can you love in Christ and not like them? Uh, yes. But let me, let me give a little bit more definition to the terms before people get a little, go off the deep end with it. Um, we are always called to love everyone. We're always called to love everyone. The Bible says to even love our enemy. But that doesn't mean that we need to like what they do. We have to separate the, 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 the person from their actions. So I love you because God saw fit to put you on this planet. Even my worst enemy. I've got to love them because even if they're my enemy, God allowed them to exist. And not only did he allow them to exist, he died for them just like he died for me. 
So out of that place, I have a love and respect for every single human being on this planet, whether I agree with them or disagree. And from that place, I try and uh, gauge my thoughts and my feelings towards them. But I don't need to like everything that everyone does, nor do I need to spend a lot of time with everyone. Jesus was very specific on who he spent his time with, and I guarantee you he had people that he liked and people that he didn't like. But he loved everybody. He made a whip and beat people out of the temple and drove them out, all the money changers and everything. But he loved them. As that whip was hitting their behind, it was in love. So, yes, we need to love everybody, but we don't have to like what they do. And we don't have to always be around them. Now, here's something that I want to uh, zero in on, though. When you love someone, you don't seek their harm. Sometimes when we don't like someone, then we will talk about them, we'll, we'll do all types of stuff and you know curse them and all that. That's not loving them. If you don't like someone, that's fine. Don't talk about them. Don't curse them. As a matter of fact, the Bible says to bless those who curse you and pray for those who spitefully use you. So I want to make sure that the way that we treat people is consistent, even though what they may do to us or uh, how they're um, making us feel isn't, isn't comfortable. So I hope that makes sense. What is the difference between baptism of the Holy Spirit and being filled with the Holy Spirit? Is one a one-time occurrence and the other a continual process? And why does Jesus say in John 20, 22, receive the Holy Spirit even though it's before Pentecost? Great question. So there's the, 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 the baptism of the Holy Spirit and there's the, the, the receiving of the Holy Spirit. When someone was filled with the Holy Spirit, you see that many times in the Old Testament, they were filled with the Spirit. That was a momentary blessing that God gave in that moment so that they can do an extraordinary feat or go, do something beyond what they were capable uh, of doing in their own natural gifting strengths that God has given. So you see that there is uh, the, the giving of the Spirit in, in that sense. But when you are baptized with the Spirit, that means that now the Spirit of God dwells inside of you. So it goes beyond just the work of the Spirit. It is now the filling of the Spirit. So when you get saved, that is a work of the Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit that came in, convicted your heart, uh, enacted that faith inside of you to believe in Jesus, and then now begins the process of washing and regenerating your heart and your mind. But when you have received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, that is the empowerment, the infilling of God to now go out and do the things in a power that is beyond you. So one is the, the conviction to, to receive Christ and come to him. The other one is now the empowerment to walk out a godly lifestyle. So when Jesus breathed on them and said, receive the Holy, the Holy Spirit, that was, a, that was a preemptive spirit that was coming to them, preparing them to receive the infilling of the Holy Spirit that we see on the day of Pentecost. And on the day of Pentecost, there, that, was, that was both the infilling of the Spirit, but also a special impartation because we see again in Acts, uh, Acts chapter 4 that the Spirit filled them again. So there is being filled with the Spirit, but then there's that special impartation that, that happens. The Spirit of the Lord came upon them. That means that in that moment, they're about to do something special outside of the norm. So I, I hope that, that answers the question. So it's the, it's the conviction of the Holy Spirit to live the life and then the empowerment of the Spirit to actually walk it out and we see that throughout scripture so it's uh, it's consistent it says so can we test God um, it says can we test God but in the scriptures it says don't test your God here's getting and testing him um, this wasn't a test of God this was a, a confirmation and here's the difference the test would be like I what I ex explained earlier the test is to see if God is able. That's when you test God. You're trying to see if God is able. So, Jesus, if you're real, walk through the wall. Then I'll believe in you. That wasn't the heart of Gideon. The heart of Gideon was, Lord, I want confirmation that I'm hearing you right. I know you're able. I just want to make sure I'm hearing you right so I don't make a mistake. So it wasn't a question of God's ability. It was a question of his ability to know what God was saying to him. So it's two different hearts. So one is, when you test God, 
you're testing his ability. When you when you fleece or when you're asking for confirmation, you're it, it's a it's a representation of acknowledging your weakness as a human and not wanting to go against the holy God. So in that sense, you're not testing him. It's more of a test of self. I want to test that I can hear you right. Now a test to see if you're able to. Great question though. Um, is this one way God will break us down? This one says, is this one way God will break us down? I'm not exactly sure what the, um, all of what the question is saying. Oh, wait, let me go back a little bit. Sorry. Oh, there we go. Sorry, I have to go back and read further. It broke up the text. It says, 1 Corinthians 5, 1 through 5, talks about a sinner in God's church being delivered to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Uh, will God allow us to go through tribulations for us to come back to him? Absolutely. If God, remember, this, this breakdown and buildup, this is a continual process. It's not a one-time thing. And this is something we're going to get into, into more next week. But this is a continual process. See, once we've been broken down, we get built back up. But then you need to be broken down again and be built back up. This is how, this is how you grow. There's a layering that happens uh, throughout our time here on earth. And this particular scripture speaks of a, a very extreme situation where someone who says that they are a believer who has accepted Christ is falling away from the faith and continuing in sin. And Paul writes that he delivers such one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that they, will, that they will not lose their soul. So God will allow us to be broken down physically in any other way in order to save us for, for eternity. So that is one way uh, that he will draw us back to us. It says, uh, further asks, if we are believers and continue to sin, is this, um, is this really how we want to meet the Lord? Um, amen. That was more of a more of a statement yeah the bible says in romans chapter 6 if we who are now uh who have now died to sin how should we continue in it any longer in first john he says those who are born of god do not sin and those are very strong statements because it makes it seem like we shouldn't sin and guess what we shouldn't the problem is not that we are always going to be bound by sin the, the problem is that we believe that we're always going to be bound by sin. How many times in church have you said, you know, you're going to be a sinner until you die? That's not true. The Bible never says that. Because if that were true, then that means that death is my Savior and not Jesus. If I continue to be bound by sin and I'm a slave to sin until I die, then I just said my physical death is my deliverer from sin. Jesus is my deliverer from sin. He didn't just come to pay for my sins of the past. He came to destroy the work of sin inside of me. So I don't have to sin anymore. Now that, uh, again, that is a process of growth. But we should be better at walking with the Lord now than we were at the first. We should be getting better at not falling to the same sins that we've fallen for over and over and over again. We can't just keep claiming grace and keep living in sin. If you're doing that, you're, you're insulting the spirit of grace, according to Hebrews. And it says that you, you, you face a stricter judgment. That's not anything that I want to fall into. But a lot of that has to do with us being broken. When we continue in sin, it's usually because we are holding back a place of our heart that we're not trusting God in. And we need to be broken in that. We're either feeling that we, God can't fulfill us in that particular area. So we hold that to ourselves and try and give him everything else but that. And the truth is, is that if Jesus isn't Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. So he needs to be Lord of every area of our life. And he's worthy of that trust. He has never let me down. I've let me down, but he has never let me down. And even in my worst mistakes and all the sin that I did in my, in my you know, BC life and, and even the mistakes that I made when I knew him, he loved me through them and then now keeps me from ever doing that again. So we should be growing in that area. But if you are comfortable with sin, if you justify your sin, then you really need to break before the Lord and really allow him to be, to be Lord of your life. Um, it says, I love your ministry. Is there a way I can donate uh, somewhere? I can send a check. Uh, you know what? Yes, thank you. I, I appreciate that. Um, you can send tithes and offerings. Uh, by mail to Legacy Family uh, Church. There's the address there on the screen. We also have an, an app that you can give through called PushPay. There's instructions there. You can just text Legacy FC 
to uh, 77977. And it'll give you instructions on how you can give on your phone. Or you can give online at legacyfamily.church. And then I also want to push our, our, our app. This is, this is just so much fun, you guys. I, I downloaded it. I've been going through it with the leadership of the church. It's just an easy way to stay in touch with, with us and stay connected and get connected with the life groups, which are, are, are so important. So, um, so thank you for, for being willing to donate uh, to the church. I appreciate that. Um, so we're going to end now. Uh, I love you guys very much, but I, I, I do want to, I, I just spoke about it. I do want to encourage everybody to go on our website or go on the app and engage in the life groups. We have so many different life groups. We have a men's life group that meets on Thursday evenings. We have a women's life group that meets on Tuesday. We have youth that meets on Tuesday nights as well. This is all through Zoom. Uh, we have uh, life groups that meet in North Hollywood, in Studio City, uh, in Reseda Ranch. We have, we have so many different life groups that you can participate in, and it's so important to stay connected during this time. So please go onto our website, visit that, and connect with one of these amazing groups. There's going to be more uh, to come in the future. Also, uh, remember the covenant classes. If you want to find out more about what it is to be a believer, what it is to, uh, to be a part of a church, and then specifically what is it that our church is doing and how can you get involved, I would love to invite you to those CC classes. Again, you can go to our website and also on the, uh, on the church app. And then we have our discipleship classes, the Legacy Academy, for those who want to go deeper in their faith. This is not uh, the, 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 the milk. This is more meat and potatoes for Christians who want to go to that deeper level in understanding their faith, being strong in who they are, and being able to witness to people. One of the main reasons we don't share our faith is because we're not comfortable addressing things that we don't know the answers to. Like, can you give me any reason to believe in the existence of a God? If you can't, come to this class. We'll tell you. Do you understand why we should trust the Bible? If you don't, you should come to Legacy Academy. We will teach you. Do you understand why we believe Jesus was raised from the dead and how we can prove that? If you don't, you should come to these discipleship classes. If you don't know who the Holy Spirit is, if you don't know how to explain the Trinity, if uh, you're not sure how to read the Bible, what Bible should I read? Are there bad Bible versions? Are there good ones? Is one better than the other? If you want answers to these questions, log on to our website and sign up for the Legacy Discipleship classes. These are going to be phenomenal. I'll also post them on, on our Facebook page and Instagram and all that so you guys will have access to them. I'll try and get on that today. But I really want to encourage everybody to take this time of quarantine and let's engage. Let's engage in the process of being built up in the Lord and being transformed. When we break out of this quarantine time, when all this ends, this church should be bigger, stronger, faster, more in love with Jesus, more on fire for God, more called, everything. We should just be at a whole other level. But that's only going to happen if we intentionally engage in the process of being broken and then being built back up in every area. That is it for today. Love you guys so much. Have a great week. Don't forget Wednesday night we have our Wednesday night Bible study. We're going through the book of Acts with our live Q&A. We also have Friday night bedtime stories for families and the kids. And then Saturday night has been so much fun with our Bible trivia. Uh, everybody's winning Starbucks cards left and right. So we want to invite you guys to those. All that information again is on our website. God bless you all. Have a great day. I love you and look forward to seeing you face to face soon. Mm -hmm.